My name is Dr. G. Welcome to That's Unusual, my podcast uncovering the unusual stories behind the world's most interesting people. On this show, we celebrate what makes us different and how we convert those differences into unexpected opportunities. Welcome to That's Unusual. You know what? We're now on our 11th episode. And if you haven't done so, please go ahead and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And while you're there, go ahead and leave me a review. That helps me out tremendously. My guest today is the ultimate trend curator, Rohit Bhargava. He's a highly sought after keynote speaker and the author of not one, but five best selling books, including Personality Not Included, Lycanomics, and his well known book series called Non Obvious. Leaders of some big, well known brands, including the likes of Under Armour, Marriott, Unilever, LinkedIn, American Express, and many, many others, depend on his strategic marketing advice, helping them understand how to lead with personality, create more human organizations, and even learn to predict the future. As a non boring keynote speaker, he has headlined events in over 31 countries and has been featured in the New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and NPR, among others. His top-ranked marketing blog and signature trend series has been read by millions of people across the globe. In this episode, Rohit shares with us a few of his latest non-obvious trends, his signature methods for spotting the non-obvious, how he generates his story ideas, the importance of storytelling to create influential businesses that connect with their audience, and his backstory for branching out on his own, and much, much more. As you listen to this episode, I ask that you reflect on your own unusual stories and unique qualities that can help open doors to unexpected opportunities. And so with that, let's get started. I'm so excited about today's episode of That's Unusual. With me today, I have Rohit Bhargava. Welcome to the show, Rohit. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we've known each other for some time. You're the trend guy. I mean, you have sort of made a nice mark in, in this world in terms of being able to and putting a process behind identifying trends. You know, you're you're also an author of not just one, but five best selling books. Not many people can say that. It includes personality not included, like economics, and of course, your non obvious series of books. And plus, you've got a background in marketing. I just want to jump right in and tell us in, in your words. I mean, you have a new edition of non-obvious coming out for 2017. And non-obvious is somewhat of a non-obvious type of phrase. Tell us in your words what non-obvious means to you. And I'll have a follow-up question from there. Yeah, totally. Well, for me, non-obvious was the antidote to a lot of stuff I was seeing when I was reading. Because I'm a pretty voracious reader like yourself. And, and I just saw a lot of stuff about trends where people were saying the same thing over and over again that wasn't necessarily wrong, but it was stupid. And it was obvious. You know, so at the end of the year, you know, the same thing comes around and you pick up the Inc. magazine issue and it's like five trends to watch for 2017. And, you know, trend number one is the rise of the internet, you know, and trend number two is, you know, 3D printing. And like all of these so called <laughs> trends are basically just stating stuff that exists. And I started thinking to myself probably about seven years ago when I was reading this stuff, I'm like, you know, these are not trends. These are just like somebody picked something out and was like, oh, I think Facebook's going to keep growing. So I'll just make Facebook a trend. And so the frustration around that was what caused me to release my first non obvious trend report back in 2011. And the whole goal of that was to try and talk about things that I thought were actually trends, things that described the way I describe a trend as the accelerating present. So it's something that's mm. happening right now that's changing our behavior and that's accelerating. And that was the motivation behind that first report all the way back then. The accelerating present, love it. And it's so true. I mean, I go to conferences all the time and I'm often, it's so troubling to see that you know, every time you get to a conference, by the time, whatever they're talking about those conferences typically tends to be old news. And it, it's certainly not trends, yet everyone looks at it. It's kind of like if you're, if you're focused on that stuff right now, you're already behind the game and you're really looking at what's the future hold for us and how do we prepare ourselves to basically adopt some of these trends or, or get ahead of the game to some degree with some of these non-obvious trends that you have. So you've got a new edition coming out and, you know, I love, and I was, I was on your site, you know, looking at 
some of the the questions that you ask from your original non-obvious book. It says, what do Disney, Bollywood, and Bat Kid know about creating celebrity experiences? You know, how can vending machines inspire world peace? I mean, these are such amazing questions that you're asking here that are so non-obvious in nature. What do we have, um, you know, can you share and give us a little bit of a taste or a teaser of what we can expect in some of your non-obvious 2017 trends? Yeah, I can. So, you know, you'll love the questions around this uh, latest trend report because, you know, they are similarly enticing. So, you know, one of the questions, for example, is, this is from the back cover of the new one, what unexpected insights can a holographic Holocaust survivor and Japanese film about soy sauce teach us about career development? You know, and I'm intentionally kind of taking the most interesting stories from the book, but the idea behind doing that is a lot of my research is about finding intersections. And I use that word a lot, intersection thinking, right? And I know that's a a big thing for you as well, which is, you know, we don't live our lives sitting in one industry and thinking only about that one industry, even though there's a lot of pressure from our careers to do that. And the most interesting ideas a lot of times come in that white space between industries. And so a lot of the trends that I'm identifying are trends that don't fit into any one industry category or another because they have examples from multiple industries. And so I do with this trend book and the annual trend report, probably the dumbest thing that any author can ever do, which is refresh and rewrite about 40% of their book every single year, which is basically what I've done for the last several years with non-obvious. So the format of the book is that the first part is all about how to predict trends and how to predict the future. And the second part is 15 new trends for that particular year. So every year, that 15 trend section gets completely updated with brand new trends. Yeah, I love that element of how you thread that into your book and and sort of revise it every single year. And oftentimes we see books and they're outdated within a year or two, just because the markets have changed so drastically. And given some of the new, you know, digital media and publishing that's available to us, I love the fact that every single year we can get a new set of trends to take a look at and, and see what's changed over the course of the last year and, and what could be different for the following year. I've known you for some time and and certainly you're very methodical and purposely driven in terms of how you identify, you know, sources of inspiration for your trends. Can you talk a little bit about what your process is like? I know you share some of this in your in your book in terms of how others can spot trends, but what's your process like? I mean, how do you come up with some of your your material? Yeah, so I spend an entire year gathering stories for the annual trend report. And when I say gathering stories, it's a combination of interviewing people at events. So I probably speak at about 40 events a year. So I meet a lot of people, both on the stage, but also like audience members. So I interview a lot of people and ask them about ideas. I get to listen to speakers at conferences. So anybody who's been to events, I mean, your unusual event recently was a great example. I mean, there's so much inspiration in listening to other speakers. And I am really lucky because as a speaker at events, I have the benefit of also listening to great speakers at events. So I have a lot of input when it comes to listening to great minds. You know, I probably buy, let's say, 50 or 60 books a year at least. Mm. So at least every week I'm getting books from Amazon just delivered straight to my to my house. And everybody in the family knows, so they just kind of stack up here. I don't necessarily read them all cover to cover, but you know, I think that business books, I'm a firm believer that you don't really need to read every business book cover to cover, including mine. Like you, if you get the ideas and you kind of know what the ideas can do for you, uh, read the first couple chapters. It's great. I mean, we put this pressure on ourselves from school to like start a book and then we have to finish it. But like mm-hmm. nobody's asking you to do a book report anymore, you know? So if you get and- the idea, if you get the value from the book, like that's okay. Like read the first three chapters and then move on. It's fine. And are, are you reading mostly nonfiction? Or are you reading fiction? Are you mixing it up in, in sort of a variety of different genres? I do mix it up. Yeah, I love historical fiction. So like mm-hmm. that's one of my favorite categories. It's not necessarily that valuable for my trend report. Although, you know, you will see that like when I recommend reading, like there's some amazing books like you know, Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman is like one of my absolute favorites. And, you know, they just inspire you to think a little bit differently, which is partially what the book's about. So it's not just hey, read Business Week magazine and only read business books and that's it. Like we got to go broader than that. And I know you're a poetry fan and I am too. Yeah. You know, those are great inputs. 
You know, aside from the great material that you have in your books, I think your style of writing is so human. It's so conversational that I think it makes for really easy, quick reading, which I love about it. Who are some of your influences over the years and, and styles that you've gravitated towards? So early on, I was really heavily influenced by a screenwriter's style. And what I love about screenwriting is every word that a screenwriter or a playwright, for that matter, puts down on paper is something someone says out loud. And so I think when you start to think about writing as something that people say to one another, as opposed to like academic prose that you write down on a piece of paper, you know, I've had to write a plenty of that. I mean, I have a master's degree in English literature. You don't <laughs> get through that without having to write some really pedantic stuff, right? But that's right. I, that's I, not it's, the it's funny because I had the same major as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're like, you know, twins separated at birth for many reasons, <laughs> which is probably a different story, right? But, um, <laughs> You know, but yeah, it's so, so for me, it's like the this chance to write in a human way by using language that people would actually say. And I think that there's so many aspects of business, so many kind of industries, like think about the legal industry, like how much better would legal documents be if they were written in language that people actually said to one another, you know? Going back to your current book that you've just revised, Not Obvious, I mean, you've got sort of an interesting perspective where you can sort of look at trends over the course of time. Now, it's not really a prediction book. You're not trying to create a crystal ball, but it's really based on some observations. I mean, what have you seen from your perspective that's been sort of the biggest shift over the years? You know, what in your view will be the biggest shift going forward? There are definitely some, you know, I kind of hear in between your your question, this idea of macro trends, right? So Mm -hmm. I'm predicting 15 trends that are changing the business world mostly in a couple of different categories. Usually I break it into five categories. So I've got marketing and social media, culture and consumer behavior, media and education, technology and design, and economics and entrepreneurship. So those are my kind of five broad categories. And if you'll notice, none of them is like healthcare or financial services or retail Mm -hmm. because the trends cross those boundaries. But the idea behind it is you know, I'm trying to take these pieces from all these different places and put them together into something that describes the world as it is. But there are definitely are some macro trends. For example, businesses acting in more human ways. So, you know, the social side of business, not social media, but the cause related standing for something bigger than themselves idea that was brought to life probably most predominantly by CVS deciding to stop selling tobacco and taking a estimated billion dollar revenue hit, you know, with a B, right, on um, Mm -hmm. on their revenue because they did that, but because they thought it was the right thing to do. You know, like those types of signature statements are more and more being intersected with business. And so this idea that businesses have to act in more human ways, that they have to embrace things like social media, I mean, that's a macro shift. The trend isn't, hey, more businesses are getting onto Instagram, you know, like that's just one sign of this broader idea that companies are embracing this human side. Mm-hmm. Has anything surprised you over the course of time? Like any any particular trends, whether it be micro or macro, anything just really stand out? Yeah, you know, every year I have something that, that surprises me. So one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is not just predicting these 15 trends and then kind of throwing them out there and then forgetting about them. Uh, I have a very transparent process to actually go back and look at the trends that I predicted every year and see whether they actually panned out and continued to accelerate or they didn't. And I think that what a lot of people tend to think is, oh, okay, well, you're publishing the 2017 report, so that means that the 2016 report's old, it's expired. And actually what happens with trends is they don't really expire. They either continue to accelerate or they don't. And what I routinely find, especially in more recent years, because I'm getting better at it, is that the trends that I predict in 2016 or 2015 or 2014, that at the time I called non-obvious, continue to be trends, but they become more obvious because Mm. they're broader, they're bigger, more companies are paying attention to them. And so non-obvious trends become obvious over time, but they don't get disqualified or thrown out. So what I usually tell people is, look, the new book has brand new trends and everybody wants to focus on what's new. But the older trends have a lot of relevance and value as well. And there's more than 100 of them in the past. And so each one in the 2017 version of Not Obvious, every single previous trend has a letter grade attached to it. Mm. So I'm going back and I'm grading them based on their longevity and saying, yeah, this one panned out, this one didn't, here's why. 
So you've got your own version of a scorecard that you've put in there. Exactly. That's great. You know, a, a lot of your trends are there things that companies can ultimately, you know, look at and say, hey, we need to be addressing this here and today, or are they mostly designed for this is what you need to be keeping an eye out for when it does become obvious into the marketplace? Yeah. So my angle, I mean, you know, you'll appreciate this. Like when I started doing these trend reports, there's a lot of people who do trend predictions. They call themselves futurists. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, produce trend forecast reports. And there's a lot of that stuff out there. Which I've never quite understood, actually. How yeah. I mean, they're, because they're, you know, they're very big ideas. They're pies in the sky. They're like, you know, by 2050, everything's going to be solar powered and, you know, our cars are going to be feeding us because our the waste produced on the road will turn into food. And, you know, it's like all this crazy stuff that, you know, could come true. I mean, they could be right, but it's not really valuable today because it's not based on what's happening right now. So to answer your question, every single one of my trends is based on something that's happening right now. And that's going to happen or occur with more frequency over the coming year. That's where the accelerating present mentality comes in. So when it comes to companies trying to use these, the whole point is, and this is actually what I've built the whole business around, is these are the trends, but you can start using them right now. They're all actionable. And that's what I aim to help these companies do. That makes great sense. And, and I love it. I want to shift focus a little bit here and get inside the head of Rohit and get to learn sort of what took you down this journey, because you've certainly had an unusual journey over the course of your career. I mean, here you are, you're an Indian American guy. You spent some years in Australia. You play the drums. You're an English lip major. You've got a creative slant to, to what you do. And that's not typical for most people who come from your background, especially as an immigrant minority, where we're usually pressured into being doctors and engineers or lawyers. You've had creative stints in, in Ogilvy and Leo Burnett and a number of other big name agencies. Can you tell us a little bit about you know your upbringing, how you sort of ended up in the career path that you're on today and sort of venturing out on your own? Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I mean, it is a path that was not all that encouraged by our parents' generation because it's a little bit harder to understand. It was not a good day when I told my dad I wanted to be an English major. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not exactly the conversation. Right. Where's the money coming from? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the reason why I ended up there was because I knew that the thing I was good at was communications. And that in itself is kind of a soft skill, right? I mean, every job needs communications, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you need to be able to communicate. So when you're the sort of person who realizes, hey, this is what I'm really good at, talking and writing words down, well, where does that leave you, right? Because all of a sudden you're like, well, I could do anything with that, right? So do I want to be a teacher because I'm an English major and that's probably the only thing I could get a job doing? Just to note out, I mean, you are a teacher. I mean, you're a professor of at Georgetown yeah. University. Well. I'm a, uh, I describe myself as an occasional professor because I only teach one <laughs> class ever during a semester and that's about all I can handle. So I admire anyone who can be much more than that, just a, you know, occasional professor. You know, what's interesting about teaching though is uh, not, not to take you off track here, but- yeah. I'm sort of the occasional professor as well. And what's what's interesting about it is that I actually think I learn more as a result of teaching others over that process. And it's a little bit of a selfish thing, but by keeping a foot in academia, it sort of forces you to one, be a better communicator, and two, you learn from the other students that are within the class itself. I feel like I gain more as, as a teacher than probably the students do. It's interesting. It's been very different with the different things that I've taught. So, you know, I used to teach global marketing strategy. And there, it was really good for me because I started learning how to mentor younger team members. And at the time, I was still at Ogilvy. And so that was like a really valuable skill because, you know, it's natural when you start to get good at something to take the default position of, oh, I'll just do it. You know, I'll just figure it out. And when you're in a team environment, that's not the best way to do things. I mean, you got to bring people with you. You got to make sure that everybody's skill level gets higher. And so teaching really helped me with that. And now my current class is pitching and storytelling. And so that's more of like a public speaking sort of class. And what I'm finding with that is that it's forcing me to be more disciplined about how I am as a speaker on stage and the habits that I have, both good and bad, and being conscious of them and getting to be a better performer when it comes to doing things like keynote speaking and things like that. So in that case, it's definitely making me better because I'm forced to pay attention to those 
basics that maybe I wouldn't otherwise. So it's almost like you use the world, whether it be your your academia involvement or going to keynotes and conferences and meeting others, almost a little bit as a testing ground for some of your material and some of your thinking. I almost like see it analogous to how comedians go on the road and do improv at some of these small little venues to see how people react and what people are talking about and what's resonating with them. And then they go on the big stage and they produce a lot of this great material that has surfaced from sort of using the world as kind of their lab. You know, if I'm being totally honest, the 2017 edition of the book coming out now, I probably am using this podcast a little bit like that too, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I'm trying out new ways of describing things. I'm, I'm doing exactly what you just said. So yeah, real world testing ground. Do that all the time. Yeah, I find that fascinating. So let's, uh, I took you off track a little bit. We we're talking about your upbringing. We we're talking about your path to being an English lit major and a communications expert. And what happened from there? I know you ended up somehow in Australia and working for some big agencies. Tell us about that. Yeah, Australia was my chance in my 20s to just go off and go somewhere and do something. And so I wanted to be in Australia because I knew the Olympics were coming there. And I had been in Atlanta during the 96 Olympics. And I just thought mm -hmm. it was such an exciting, great time. So I moved to Australia in 1998 without a job, not knowing anybody, and I got a working visa before going. So at least I knew that I was legally allowed to work, so I wouldn't have to like <laughs> pick grapes and you know do that kind of. Well, that's always a good step to take. People do, but I knew I wanted to stay there for longer. So you can do that if you're going to stay there for a couple of months, but if you want to stay for a few years, you probably need to be legal, um, or at least I thought so. <laughs> so. I got my working visa after nine months of waiting. So I was basically in DC my hometown waiting tables until I got that visa. Once I got it, I picked up and left and went to Australia. I eventually, I found a job uh, after three weeks um, living in the in the hostel there. And that's kind of what jump-started me into the agency world because I got a job. That's not bad. Three, three weeks is pretty quick. That's pretty good. Three weeks was pretty quick. And the job I ended up getting was solely because in 1998, I had decided that I was going to pick up one of these 500-page books on how to teach myself HTML in a week and I learned how to <laughs> hand code HTML. And so the first job I got was a three week gig hand coding HTML, <laughs> which was a totally marketable skill at that time, much more than being an English major. That is so funny, not to be any more creepy in terms of the parallels between our lives, but I did the same thing. I self taught myself HTML back in the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. We were doing the same thing. Like it's like parallel universes. Probably. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, you know, and so that was a bankable skill. And after three weeks, I realized that the reason they needed a short term HTML coder was because their project manager sucked. You know, after three weeks, they basically moved her somewhere else and gave me her job. And so then I had a project manager job uh, at a digital agency. And that was where I started. I mean, you've worked with Ogilvy and Leo Burnett. I mean, what was that experience like? Did it set the foundation for a lot of the things that you're doing now? I'd imagine it had a lot of influence. Yeah, Leo Burnett was my first kind of big agency job. I probably developed some bad habits there because yeah. that was during the dot-com boom in Australia, which was like 2000, 2001. And I had this great job with probably the greatest job title I'll ever have, which was in the web world, if you were project managing jobs, they didn't call you a project manager. You called yourself a producer. Yeah. And I was in charge of the producers. So my job title was executive producer, which is such an <laughs> awesome job title to have it, you know, 25 years old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, you know, here I was executive producer at Leo Burnett with my newly minted business cards, this beautiful office with these floor to ceiling windows overlooking the Sydney Harbor mm -hmm. and the Heineken as a client. So every Friday we just have like an open bar with just as much chicken as you want. And this is Australia, so they have a bell in the office, like a lunch bell that literally rings at 5 p.m. on Friday saying, hey, you're not allowed to work anymore. Like, it's time to party. So for me, that was like the perfect thing at that time. And that was what developed my love of this whole kind of ad agency world. Because in your 20s, that's a great industry to be in. I mean, I know a lot of people make a, a great living much later on, but being in your 20s in the ad agency world, is fun. You work on a lot of different clients. You get a lot of interesting work. You're doing copy writing and producing. You get to see the ads that your team's working on on TV, you know, because advertising agencies, you're producing this stuff and then you watch TV and, hey, we did that, you know? So there's, there's a cool factor to that. 
Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a cachet and a glamour towards the ad agencies, and I've been in that world as well. You at some point decided to make the leap and, and branch out and venture out on your own. Was it was it something that you saw broken within the world of agencies, big agencies in particular, that needed some fixing and, and you were out to solve it? Or was it just a matter of time before you were going to venture out on your own? I was never really a born entrepreneur, kind of like lemonade stand when I was a kid sort of guy. And to be honest, I mean, I only branched out you know, three years ago. And so I was 38 years old before I became an entrepreneur. Mm. So for me, it was relatively late compared to other entrepreneur friends that I have that I know. But for me, it was the perfect time to do it because I was kind of at the point at Ogilvy where it was good, but I was clearly outgrowing the role that I that I had. Not because I was too important, but because my interests were going in other directions. I mean, keynote speaking, for example, like paid keynote speaking is not something that really fits into the agency model because right. when you go and speak at a conference and you work in an agency, you're supposed to bring business to the agency or you moderate a panel where your client is on the panel, right? I mean, these are industries where you're not supposed to be the superhero. You're supposed to be behind the scenes and the client's supposed to be the one that is you know, front and center. Yep. And keynote speaking by definition is not that. It's your front and center. You're the business celebrity. You're the one that they're promoting. And so that was kind of at odds with my role. And so eventually it was just kind of inevitable. I mean, I knew that I would have to have to go. So from a personal level, I mean, uh, certainly there was a sort of an evolving fit in terms of what was and what wasn't working for you. But from a professional level, you certainly operate your organization, Influential Marketing Group, at a very different in a very different way from how big agencies operate. And you sort of, you know, coined this term concierge marketing, you know, where you provide ongoing services that's somewhat related to some of the work that you did in big agencies. And what do you see? You know, is the agency world broken from a professional standpoint versus, you know, aside from your personal differences with them, but from a professional standpoint, do you think the agency world as it stands today is broken? I think that there's one huge piece in the middle of the agency world that is broken. And the piece that's in the middle that's broken is the fostering and training of future leadership and future experts. There's a lot of this idea in the agency world that it's all about the pitch and we sell the pitch. And the smart people who are on top, the the men and women who have kind of grown their expertise are the ones who will come up with the strategy and come up with the creative stuff and everybody's the executive you know vp executive <laughs> producer the you know like executive creative director like and then we have these idiotic job titles in agencies called junior strategist mm. i mean what the hell is a junior strategist <laughs> like you're either a strategist or you're not a strategist right like why <laughs> pick junior in front of somebody's title like who would want to pay for that right like what client says give me junior strategy nobody so You know, this idea that like there's these people who need to be kept down in the agency because they're younger. And so maybe we'll just give them the social media stuff because they must understand that, right? And everything else will lead to the experts means that you have this huge gaping void of people in their kind of 30s, early 30s probably, who haven't really been fostered to become leaders or to become experts. And so now you're kind of in this stuck position because the people who are in their in their 40s, like, and they don't want to do that same 80 hour a week grind anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, they want something a little bit different. Yeah, that's so true. And certainly reflects my experiences at those agencies as well. As sort of an accidental entrepreneur, you've now been operating on your own for a few years now and, and very successful at it. But no venture comes without its difficulties. And of course, when you look back, you know, is there a single biggest lesson that you've learned that would be helpful to others? Or if you had a chance to do something over again, what would you do differently? I would say that the biggest thing I've learned is that it's a cliche that you don't ever really get until you get. And it's that you have to spend money to make money. And I underestimated how much I would need to spend. Because when you become an entrepreneur and you're on your own, it's all about you know, my mm-hmm. whole first year, I had a very simple revenue target. It's like, can I make the same amount that I was making in my full time job? Yeah. If I can do that, then you know, maybe I can do this successful. So it was all about like just revenue replacement. That was it. The second year that I was in business, it was like, okay, you know, can I grow this? Can I make more than I was making before? Right. Mm-hmm. The third year, which is what I'm now coming to the end of, was, you know, can I set myself up so that I can make as much or more with doing you know, not that much more work. So can I automate some of these things? Can I start to bring them out? 
right? And now that I'm about to hit my fourth year, I'm really thinking about growth. How do I like get even bigger, bring more work to more people? Because we're in a freelancer economy where people want the gigs. And, and the thing that I benefited from being uh, a little bit older when I started my company was I built my network for 20 years. So, you know, when I started, I didn't have that cold call moment where it's like, oh my God, who's my first client going to be? I mean, I started and I already had my first four clients, right? And it wasn't because I poached them from Ogilvy. I mean, these were brand new people that, you know, I hadn't worked with before, but I knew from my network who became my clients because they're like, oh, you're on your own. Perfect. We need, you know, this, we need that, we need that. So for me, it was all about this process of evolution and realizing that, you know, things that can drive my business forward are totally worth paying for. Things like an amazing designer, right, to figure out the branding. Things like paying for a great PR representation to get the book and the concept of the book out there. And so now I'm at a place where I've actually started three companies now. So Influential Marketing Group's one of them. I have a publishing company called Idea Press. And I have another company that I recently started called The Non-Obvious Company that's built around the concept of these trends in this book. And it's with a business partner out in L.A. And the whole idea is to take it to an innovation consultancy around the trends. Can you share more uh, about that? Yeah. So that one, the vision of that one was that I've always been a marketing guy. And so the, the logical thing for me was to create the influential marketing group, right? And that mm -hmm. was this network of, of people that could provide advice. And you mentioned concierge marketing and concierge marketing was my solution to one of the challenges I saw in the agency world, which is everything was time and materials. You know, you want more time, you pay this crazy hourly rate for this person. And I said, this is dumb. I mean, if I was a customer, I wouldn't want that. I would want to know that, look, what's the fair price to pay f to have you as an expert in my corner. And once we negotiate the price, you should be ready to do whatever I need you to do. And that's what I built concierge marketing for. So that is a flat rate for companies to have on-demand access to me whenever they need help. And because that's such a dangerous model, and you know why it's dangerous, because you know you could have your time completely sucked up if you don't put any parameters on it, which is why agencies are generally afraid to do things that way, and consulting mm -hmm. companies are too. The only way I could make that work is to be really specific about the clients that I chose to work with on that. You know, I've turned down more potential companies that wanted that model than I've accepted for the last three years. And the reason I've done that is because if you take the wrong client on under this model, you're just going to kill yourself, right, with too much time and effort spent on all of these different things. But if you do it successfully, it's a great model for everybody. People love it because they're like, look, you know, I know what I have to budget. I can cover your monthly retainer, whatever it is. And I know that I'm going to get help on the things that are most important to me from the guy who is the expert or the girl who's the expert and not the person who works for them, who's a junior person that's never been mentored or trained to be great. Yeah, that makes great sense. And I'm always intrigued by just simply observing you over the course of the, of the years and, you know, certainly your approach to, you know, how you communicate, how you storytell, how you run a business is, is not obvious in and of itself. And I think there's a lot that folks can learn from it. Unfortunately, we only have, you know, 30 minutes, but they should probably look into your information, look at your background, look at the work that you're doing and derive some inspiration and ideas from that. I want to shift gears for a little bit. This is sort of the closer of our show. And I ask all of our guests sort of a series of fill in the blank, rapid fire, mad lib type of questions. So if you're okay with that, there's just five questions here and we'll just go really quick down the line here. And it's just, you know, whatever comes top of mind is, is perfectly good. Nothing right or wrong. Okay. All right. The first one is the best piece of advice I ever received was? To treat others in a way that brings them along with you rather than keeps them down. I love that. You've got that moniker next to your name that uh, you're just a nice guy as well. And I think that dovetails very nicely with that. Okay, next question. I'm most curious about? I am most curious about people unlike myself. Mm, makes sense. Now, you've, certainly you've written in a number of different books, but if you had to write an autobiography, of course, about yourself, the title of the book would be? I am a little bit ahead on that, I think, because I've kind of branded my big ideas. So I would say think non-obvious would be my <laughs> thing because I already kind of have that out there as my view of the world. Okay. If you could invite three people over for dinner, dead or alive, who would you invite and what would you talk about? I would invite Isaac Asimov. 
I'd invite mm-hmm. Steve Martin, and I'd invite <laughs> Martin Lindstrom. And people might not know who the last guy is, but he's a consumer behavior researcher, and he travels the world, spends like 250 days a year traveling the world, living in people's houses, and basically seeing how they use products and how they oh, wow. interact with things. And he's written a book called Small Data. And his book is all about these fascinating patterns he sees between how people relate to the stuff that they have and the things that they buy. And so him, Steve Martin, I just love as a comedian, but also as a writer. A lot of people don't know he's an amazingly gifted screenwriter. And everything you need to know about Steve Martin comes from a book that he wrote based on his Twitter account. And the entire book, he was going to write it based on funny tweets that he put out there because he's a comedian. Mm -hmm. But the book ended up being a compilation of the funniest responses he got from his readers to his tweets. And I think that tells you a lot about the sort of- That's that's interesting. Do you know the book name off the top of your head? I can picture the cover. I'm blanking on it. But Steve Martin, Twitter, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to have to go follow him on Twitter now just to get a glimpse of that. That's a fascinating combination. I love those three. All right, last question for you. You know, of course, on this podcast, we celebrate all of those things that make us unique and different. So how would you fill in this blank? I'm unusual because? I'm unusual because I see things that other people miss. Perfect. Love it. Perfect closing to this. So Rohit, it was so great to have you on the show. Thank you for contributing your time for our listeners. Before we wrap up though, if someone wanted to learn more about you, your work, your books, the keynotes that you're delivering, where would you direct them to go? The easiest place is my personal site, which is just my full name, so rohitbargava.com. And there you'll find my blog, you'll find links to all the books, and you'll find me trying to be useful. I and mean, the last thing I'll offer to be useful is the name of that book. <laughs> it is called The 10 Make That 9 Habits of Very Organized People. Make That 10. <laughs> great. Even the title's so non obvious and great. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. So, Rohit, thanks for your time. Thanks for being on the show. Always a delight talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi again. It's me, Dr. G. If you are still listening, I'm hoping it's because you enjoyed this podcast. If you would like to hear future episodes, you could really help me out by subscribing to the That's Unusual podcast on iTunes and leaving a review. It goes a long way in helping me get the word out from avid listeners like you. As a thank you, I will be selecting one new reviewer each week at random for a free private 15-minute phone conversation where you can ask me anything and get professional advice on your career or business to help you stand out and make a difference. Also, if you want to be notified of any future episodes, please visit thatsunusualpodcast.com and sign up to receive updates on new episode releases. Until next time, remember to always think unusual.